We spent a lot of time working on imitative counterpoint and fugue. During the lessons on fugue, we saw how to construct the stretto table in order to explore possible limitations of the subject. This kind of exploration can lead us on to more elaborate forms of imitation, like canon. The word canon means law, and that is exactly what a canon is, a piece of imitation where a leading part is strictly imitated by one or more following parts. Unlike imitation in fugue, where the following part may deviate occasionally from the leader in order to make better overall harmony or to fit better in context, imitation in a canon is rigid, allowing for no deviations except at the very end in order to make a more convincing cadence. Strictly speaking, it is possible to simply bring the leading part to a melodic cadence that's then imitated by the follower. Here the ending simply consists of the two parts falling silent one after the other. But more often the composer wants a cadence that's harmonically conclusive, and that means stopping the canon in the last bar or two to allow the lower part to become a free bass line. Although every kind of imitation has a corresponding canon, some are virtually inaudible. For example, imagine a 50 bar retrograde canon where the following part would start with the end of the leading part. Obviously no listener could possibly hear this relationship until the whole canon was complete. But how many listeners would remember the start of the subsidiary part 50 bars later? Perhaps a careful listener might notice the canon at the midpoint, where the parts exchange material around the axis of symmetry. But again, this is not of much use in real-world composition. The more exotic canons, like the one just described, are like difficult crossword puzzles. They may be fun for a composer as a challenge, but they have no special audible interest. In this lesson, we'll only discuss the clearly audible forms of canon. Not surprisingly, the vast majority of canons in real-world composition fall into this category. We'll start with the most common example, canon at the unison or the octave. From a melodic point of view, the lines in a canon are like those in any other counterpoint. They need to focus on limited material and to evolve and develop in interesting ways. The big problem in this kind of canon, however, is harmonic. Since the following part, by definition, has exactly the same notes as the leading part, how can we prevent the harmony from going around in circles? Here's an example. As we can see, this canon can seem to escape from the F-sharp tonic chord. Now here's the same beginning with the problem solved. As we can see, the solution to this dilemma is richer harmony, including seventh chords, and also variety of dissonance treatment, in particular the use of accented passing tones. A note was consonant in the leading part can now become dissonant in the following part, allowing the music to move into different harmonies. Notice here how, in measure 2, the two dissonant passing tones take the top part smoothly up to D, which in turn creates a new harmony over the low voices F-sharp. In measure 3, the accented passing tone B keeps the line conjunct while it goes down to the low E-sharp, which is harmonizes in appoggiatura. The high G-sharp over D in measure 5 implies a 7th chord, leading to the dominant in the next bar. Another way to deal with the problem of static harmony is to add a free bass line. Bach does this very often. Here's an example from the Goldberg Variations, Variation 24, Canon at the Octave. First, here's the beginning of the canon, but without the added bass. This is nice, but a bit lacking in harmonic variety and quite bare in measure 7. Now listen to the effect of Bach's added bass line. The free part greatly enriches the harmony. When the canon begins in measure 3, the bass moves to a 6 chord for variety. 
The strong bass progression over the bar line between measure 3 and 4 reinforces the suspension in the upper part. The 4-2 chord at the end of measure 4 enriches the simple dominant to tonic progression. When the held G, the suspension in measure 4, recurs in the following voice in measure 6, the bass line gives it a different harmonic meaning. Now G is the third of a 6 chord, and the following F sharp is a passing tone. Similarly, the held D in the middle part of measure 7 now becomes part of a 5-4-2 chord. The added free bass also allows the canonic voices to come together at times in empty fourths, fifths, and octaves, so the bass will fill out the harmony. Notice also in this example the many accented passing tones so typical of Bach's harmonic richness. Incidentally, harmonic third relations in pieces based on triads are also very common in canons at the unison of the octave, since any two chord tones in the leading part can always be harmonized with two different chords a third apart. This sometimes gives these canons a slightly modal flavor. Apart from canon at the unison of the octave, it's also possible to write canons on every other degree of the scale. Here the following part will differ in interval quality according to the mode or scale being used. Imitation with the intervals maintained exactly, semitone for semitone, would force the canon to modulate all the time, moving very quickly into remote tonal regions. Here again the challenge is usually harmonic. How to make the imitation on another scale degree make harmonic sense? This is why so many of these canons have added free parts. For example, in the Goldberg variations, every third variation is a canon, with one on each degree of the scale. All these canons have a free bass line. The student should examine these canons, first playing just the imitative parts, then adding the free part to see how it clarifies and enriches the harmony. Here's an interesting example, variation number 15, canon at the upper fifth by inversion. Since this canon isn't at the unison of the octave, and in addition it's by inversion, there's no problem here with harmonic monotony. However, the bass contributes enormously to enriching the numerous empty octaves and fifths between the canonic voices, as well as to creating rich chromatic harmony. As with strettos, just as canons can be done at various pitch intervals, they can also be realized at various time intervals, from one beat to several bars. Generally speaking, the longer the time interval, the easier the canon will be to write, since the leading part has more time for harmonic variety. The student should compose several canons, for voices or instruments, at various pitch and time intervals. Some of them should include an added bass part. This little lesson on canon completes our applied counterpoint course. The final lesson will explore applications of counterpoint outside of explicitly contrapuntal forms, as well as how counterpoint can be adapted to other harmonic styles.